So here's a uh, painting that I did a few years ago to represent John Isham, the um, ancestor of nearly all the American Ishams, who appears in Barnstable, Massachusetts in 1670 or thereabouts. And that's John and his wife Jane and their house, Saltbox House. And that's meant to be Scudder's Bay, and their the house is on Isham's Point, and it's looking out to the ocean, which is the, you know, and thinking of John probably born in England and coming across on that hint of a, of a ship. And there's the farm animals, and they lived a, a self sufficient sort of existence there. The population was very sparse. Um, and he had considerable land um, in the area. And the little skunk down in the foreground to suggest the, the wildness and the wilderness of the place. What's wrong with it? Well, a few things. Um, for one thing, I took the, the um, costumes from some, uh, uh, an engraving, I think, of, uh, of some Quakers uh, in Quaker people in Boston, I believe. And... Um, I doubt that people in the countryside would have dressed like this, and it's probably unlikely that they were Quakers. The only reason I thought to do that was that there's a record of John Isham traveling some distance, taking some trouble to go be a witness to the will of a prominent Quaker. Uh, the house... The salt box house with the extended roof on the back is um, uh, typical of early New England style, but the windows are far too large because glass was such a rarity. So that's another historical error in the picture. Okay, so uh, we're talking about John, and I, uh, you can see him at the top of the list there, Barnstable in Barnstable, Massachusetts, 10 generations of American Isham's. So Isaac in, inherits the property from John. Timothy, his son, is the one who moves on. But Isham stay uh, in the area another line for quite a while. I'll say something about that in a little bit. Put the painting down. So here we have a map of the area, and you can see marked in red is uh, Isham's Point and that little uh, little waterway that comes down from Isham's Point just there is called Bumps River and it makes its way into the sea. And uh, so I was interested in visiting that because in the Brainerd Isham book, the one before this, um, actually the author of this book left it out, but in Brainerd's book is a hand-drawn map of that area, that little little area around what he calls Isham's Point. And I guess what I hadn't realized is how, just how long ago it was that the Ishams were there. And uh, so I, I thought I'd have a look. The area was being developed with, a, with quite a few new houses. I did a drive there after going to church because it was um, Easter Sunday in 2005. And I went to, went to church in Osterville, down in the corner there. You can see Isham's Point is between Osterville and Centerville. And then in the afternoon, I drove over and found my way into Isham's Point and all of the fairly recent development, but found an uh, empty lot with trees that enabled me to sort of look across the water from the bank and speculate on how it looked before all the development. On my way back, driving along beside Bumps River there, along the, the road, I saw a couple out for a stroll, and I said, who can I consult that would uh, be able to give me some uh, information about the area? And 
they said, oh, you need to see Mrs. Nolt. The Nolts have a real estate agency. And I said, but it's Sunday. And they said, oh, she'll be there. So I went to the agency just a little ways into, uh, into Centerville. And they were a very congenial couple. And they hadn't actually heard of Isham's Point. And I didn't realize then how long ago, really, the Ishams had sort of left there. But she put out her antenna, and put out her, uh, uh, yeah, put out, that's the wrong word, put out, um, in following my visit, there we are, um, Vivian's real estate, Vivian and Al uh, Nolt, and she went to work and made some contacts for me. So I had a lovely little visit, not thinking much would come of it. <clears throat> but then I heard, I heard from a couple of people. The most notable was someone called uh, Melvina, Melvina um, Cosby, who wrote me this lovely uh, letter from Centerville, Massachusetts. And she explained that her, perhaps her grandfather or great grandfather was the um, was the um, Cos Crosby, who um, bought the Isham land from the last Isham in um, from the last Isham that still lived. Uh, on the ancestral property. But before I say anything about him, uh, I'd like to maybe point out a couple of things from the from the Isham book about um, John. One is that there's a section uh, I've written at the top, uh, John Isham uh, origin mystery. A lot of research has gone into um, gone into this, uh, trying to figure out who was John Isham, where did he come from, uh, someone, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Banks, most successful researcher and genealogist for the English homes of New England, uh, was uh, given the brief when he went to England on three different occasions um, in 1924, 25, 26, to try to tra track down John Isham. And, and basically it says nothing really, um, really came of it. Um, the the uh, most likely uh, connection was with uh, the Somerset Ishams. Um, and but there's some Ishams also in Devonshire. And, um, and then he says, I discussed this phase of the uh, case with Reverend Henry Isham Longden, well known genealogist of that uh, county, and he states that there is nothing in his researches which would indicate a connection. One problem is that John Isham was likely born in between 1650 and 1660, the Commonwealth period when all the church records, including the, the uh, bishop's transcripts, are generally missing in every English parish. So if he was born in those in that decade, tracing him that's that's the big problem in tracing him. So, um, John um, appears in the book. Edward in this uh, at, at the top of the list there. Edward at, at, in this book leaves out a section of of the speculations of his origin. Some interesting material of possibilities that Brainerd comes up with, but nevertheless, um, the uh, essential biographical information is here, and you can see that uh, he had a few children, and the little star next to Isaac, who married Abigail Lambert. So uh, uh, um, Isaac also stayed on the, um, on the ancestral property. And there's some interesting things. This is Isaac's John's son uh, left a will and then he left an inventory which was 
witness noted down here by, uh, let's see, get the right finger, Mr. Hinckley, uh, which I want to refer to a little bit later. So, um, and the other thing is that Isaac was married to uh, Abigail Lumbert. So that's another name that I'd like to have you keep in mind just for a second. But before we go back to the map, a little section down here about, about the, uh, there's a house referred to in the, in the real estate and various um, things like deer skins, sheep skins, tobacco, pork, beef, half a canoe, not sure what half a canoe is, household furniture, armor, books, nice to know that there were books, so there was definitely literacy in the family. Uh, at that very early stage in the, um, at the end of, at the beginning of the, the 1700s, and um, the little paragraph says, uh, the site of the first John Isham, that's Isaac's dad, dwelling was upon Isham's Island, south of Osterville. Mr. Norman M. Isham believed he had discovered the site upon a visit there some years ago. Now, Norman Isham is an interesting architectural historian, and I have um, a couple of his books that he, uh, with illustrated books that give uh, some examples and the background of a number of the dwellings, the buildings in New England and especially in, uh, well, especially in Connecticut. The um, he got, so, so Norman Morrison was one of the people like me with an interest because he, he's much more recent, um, uh, 20th century man uh, who had um, an interest like me in, in these origins and these old buildings. He goes on, the island is now connected with the mainland. So this throws me a little bit. Uh, Isham's point is... Um, is quite a ways and what he's talking about and it's off the map here but if you notice right down in the corner where it goes off the page there's an an island it's not really south of Osterville as he says in this paragraph more to the west of Osterville and it's now called uh, Little Island and uh, the adjoining bit um, Osterville Grand Island. So he's going to call it um, Isham Island. So he says this may, oh, say, so the, the island, Isham's Island, is now connected with the mainland. Yeah, well, that's right. There's a, there's a little bridge. This may be the old house mentioned in the inventory. So, yeah, maybe so. Some distance inland was a later house, but still old. So inland on the island or inland back toward Osterville? Not sure. Or inland all the way to Isham's Point? Again, not too sure. But still old, he says, where perhaps this Isham, or this um, um, Isaac Isham, or his sons dwelt. So they may have lived there. It may be inferred that the inventory that uh, uh, that Isham was a considerable owner of not very valuable land. So his land may have actually included the area all around Osterville, moving over toward Centerville, large large land owner and that as a farmer he was entirely independent of outside resources self-sufficient it is clear that he produced his own tobacco pork 
and beef upon the farm, and that spinning and weaving went on in the house, and that shoes for the family were made there. Spinning was the work of the wife and daughters, but weaving was man's work. Probably the seven boys, as they became old and strong enough, were taught to operate the looms. Two saddles, two saddles in the inventory, seem to imply at least two horses, upon which the parents and perhaps the daughter rode to meeting or elsewhere. While the boys walked, their house was a long way from the first and second meeting houses in Barnstable. Now, Barnstable is the county, but it's also the uh, a town on the north of the peninsula, so it would be a few kilometers ride away. Their house was a long way from the first and second meeting houses, and it is not certain that they attended either of these. And uh, the meeting houses were congregational. Congregational church was set up in America because it was forbidden um, to function in England. So another group of people seeking freedom of, of worship. So Isaac was married to Abigail Lumbert, and their uh, daughter, Ab Abigail, the same name, married David Lumbert. So there's a couple of Lumbert connections. Okay, one of the things that um, Mrs. Um, Crosby sent to me was a map. And I spent quite a long time because there's no date on the map, but I'm fairly certain bec uh, that in, it's mentioned in the middle there, one of the things listed, there's a couple of stores, a couple of churches, all of the writing there are people's names, their house next to their houses who live there. So we know the names of the whole community and it's a pretty small community. So when is this? Uh, it, the, the, the Liberty Hall, which is listed there, Liberty Hall, was built in 1859. I have a map of the United States from 1854, and it has a lot of similar, similar way of presenting material. It looks similar. So it seems to be a style. And of course, the red dot is Isham's point. Um, and all of the, what we said about Osterville and that island is off to this side over here. The interesting thing is that if this is 1859, I'm going to explain in a moment that the Isham's, all of them, have, even though they were on this property for maybe close to 150 years, by the time of this map, they've all been gone for 30 or 40 years. So there's no trace of them except that down here, the name is Lumbert. And if you remember, Isaac was married to a Lumbert, so the family's still in the area. Um, and uh, Crosby, the lady who sent me the letter, her ancestors have been in the area. In fact, she lives in Crosby House, and her ancestors have been in the area, and several of these names are Crosby. And I think I mentioned from the will someone Hinckley, and it's got an unusual spelling with a C-K, H-I-N-C-K-L-Y, and there's a couple of Hinckleys. <clears throat> so the names connected to the Ishams are still very much in the area. Um, just to mention, I don't have a map, but if they were to travel to that congregational meeting house in Barnstable Town, they would have traveled several kilometers across 
up past this pond, and here they would have been about halfway to the town of Barnstable, where the meeting house was, and I, if that's where they went, and I presume there was some sort of trail or road in those early days. Okay, I think all that I wanted to say in this video, apart from that, was the was to mention this character who stayed on the family property and finally sold it to to Melvina's ancestors, the Crosbys. Was named Thomas, and so Thomas appears here. Uh, and it's not very complimentary. He had uh, three wives. I actually wrote a little, a little poem speculating about him. But it says, Thomas Isham, the last male in Barnstable, inherited the old homestead where John Isham and his son Isaac had lived at Isham's Point. Well, there we are. So maybe there was a house at Isham's Point. One who remembered him described Thomas Isham as a rough man, loud-voiced, not particular in the use of language, and fond of strong drink, no children. So three wives, no children. One would think something was going on there with, uh, with Thomas. Well, one of the things that Melvina Crosby sent me, was, along with the map, was a, uh, a deed to the, uh, the, that represented that transaction, that sale from Thomas Isham to the Crosby families. Well, as you can see, it's hardly legible. So what she very generously did was to copy out a, uh, by hand, a little, a little, reproduction of it. So you see at the top Thomas Isham and Chloe Isham. Now Chloe was Thomas's uh, mother. So his dad has uh, died at this point and he's selling the land. And you see Oliver Crosby, James Crosby, Graham Crosby, and Jahil Crosby. And there's describing the land where it is and it does sound pretty much like the area around around Isham's Point. So if they owned, if John and Isaac had owned land further east, including bits of around Osterville and that island, uh, that seems to maybe have, um, have already been sold off. Not sure. But fascinating to have this connection from one little visit, one little visit on Easter Sunday to through Mrs. Nolt, who, who corresponded with me right up until her death a couple of years ago, the making of this video, um, just sending me news and general interest things, but having connected me to Mrs. Crosby, who then could tell me about the, the last Ishams, uh, the last Ishams in, in Barnstable. And uh, so this map, which looks very old, is, as I say, maybe 40 years, made 40 years after um, the death of, of, of Thomas Isham. And the land um, was in Isham hands for nearly 115 years after the death of John. So there's a, uh, a longevity here that, uh, to get a historical sense, you struggle to get a little grasp on, or, or I did. Okay, I think I've rambled enough about John Isham and Isaac, and give you a little flavor of the things in the little items in the, um, in the, in the box where I've stored uh, materials relating to family history. Thank you.